Next up is uh, Joakim. He's going to talk about the last... The last... Now I forgot this, the name of the... Polylith, the last architecture you will ever need. And I assume it's written in closure. Yes, of course. Ooh, <coughs> good. Welcome on stage. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Um, so, welcome to this presentation of a software architecture called Polylith. And uh, with the title, The Last Architecture You Will Ever Need. Kind of cool. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, first, some background. Uh, what is Polylith? How to use it? And why you should use it? Uh, and this, this is a city. A uh, code city, and it's made by this guy. And uh, this uh, city is actually the Java Development Kit 1.5. And his project uh, makes it possible to visualize code bases as cities. And it's kind of cool. And uh, each building here is a class. And uh, the code base is divided into packages, and the top package here is the Java package. And then we have uh, sub packages uh, in this code base. And uh, in each package, we store um, classes in this case. Uh, but if it's a functional language, we would uh, put uh, functions in there. So this is how we structure code normally. But uh, let's pretend now that this is our own code base, our own project. Then we would have a source folder with a top package. And then we would put our domains in here. And uh, let's say this is uh, the booking domain. And let's say that we, with this domain we can borrow and lend the tools. Maybe between uh, people we know in our neighborhood or and um, let's say that we want to extract this uh, domain into its own service. So how do we do that? Then we, uh, then we need to create a new project, a booking service in this case. Then we add a source folder and we put uh, some top namespaces in there. And, uh, and now we can put our domains inside here. And, uh, we have some more code from the other service we, we need in the new service. For example, lender and, and stuff. And uh, some other code here. And um, the good thing here now is that the booking part of the old service is only used from one place. That means that we can just move this code into the new service. And then we can add some code to expose this uh, service to uh, yeah to the outside wor world and now we can delegate to this new service here let's have some water okay but we have some more code here also that would be nice to just move but uh, unfortunately this code is also used by the old old service so we can't just move it but uh, what can we do Maybe we can just um, copy this code. So let's try that. So we copy this code, and uh, but maybe that's not a good, really good idea, because now we need to maintain the same code from two places. And if we find a bug in one place, we need to update the code, remember to update it in the other place. So and and we kind of fail to reuse those building blocks here. But maybe you can come up with some better solutions here. Uh, what if we create a library of those building blocks? So let's do that. We create a new project with a source folder and a top package. And now we can just move the code into here. So that's great. And if we freeze the code, into a library, we can now use the code from those 
other two services here. So that's kind of good. And the good thing now is that we can work with uh, all our code from one place now. So we could, uh, so we can get rid of the code the du duplication that we had. But uh, what happens with the development experience here? Uh, be because if, if, if you want to make a change now in our first service here, we need to go back to another project, uh, the, the booking library project, edit the code, make some changes, uh, create a new library, and then we can use the code. And the same with the other service here. And um, what's bad with this? Uh, one thing is that the code base now is not in sync, you could say, because we are using different versions of the libraries. And we can't uh, guarantee here that our system systems or our system works with the latest version of the code. But I don't think this is the biggest problem. I think the biggest problem here is that um, uh, it now now we, we can't just make a little change in in a service and get instant feedback. Uh, because now now we what what we need to do now is we we need to switch project and we need to edit the code in this library project uh, build a snapshot and we need to re re reload that code into the service so so before we had instant feedback and now we have a slow feedback loop so it sounds like we could improve here so what if we could uh, grow the code instead so let's say Let's, what, what if we could uh, start a project by adding small building blocks one at a time and kind of grow them one at a time <coughs> and, and what if we could work with all, the, all our code from one place and get that uh, nice feedback, feedback loop that would be really great and what if those what, what if we could just continue adding small building blocks to our code base, like if it was a garden, that would be nice. But also, what if those building blocks were like Lego bricks? And, and, and if we could do grow the way we run the code also, what if we could put those Lego-like building blocks into one place very easily? And then, and, and if we could do that, then, then we could grow the way we run our code also. Like this. And that would be fantastic, actually. And this is actually what Polylith is about. So, what is Polylith? Um, Polylith is a software ar architecture mostly for the back end. It's simple, flexible, and it makes you pr productive. And it consists of uh, small building blocks and uh, that are easy to uh, combine and compose into uh, services, tools, and libraries. And uh, it also helps you keep your code base c consistent because we have only one of each uh, building block, so we don't add any any code duplication to our code. And it's also very flexible. And the way we extend or grow our code base is by adding one component at a time. So it's very extendable. And uh, it's also rep those uh, building blocks, they are replaceable also. So they are like Lego bricks. So very yeah, nice to work with. Uh, Polyeth also makes you productive. And, uh, and one reason is that uh, you you uh, work with all your code from one place as if it was a single code base. And um, while in production, uh, it's very easy to 
change how you uh, work, uh, how, how you run the, the, the code. So, and so in, in, in your development environment, you can work with all your code from one place. So you get, uh, so you can refactor your code, debug your code or navigate your code. While in, so, so you kind of optimize for productivity. While in production, uh, you can optimize for uh, non-functional uh, requirements. So we separate those two worlds. And this is really core to Polyth. Okay. So how uh, does it work? Um, we have those libraries. They are just the libraries you already know. Nothing uh, magic at all. And then you have, uh, we have components. And what is a component? A component is a block of code uh, that has a name. And uh, it lives in a directory that has the same name as the component. And that directory has three directories, source, test, and resources. And a component um, has an interface also. And this is not the type of interface you know, because this one has a namespace called interface. And that this uh, namespace or package or module, what you call it, has a set of functions. And this is the only thing that this component exposes to other components. And then we have one or several um, namespaces that implements the functionality. And you put functions here, too. And you can structure your code in any way you want here. And uh, the functions in the interface, uh, what they do is that each function delegates to a function in the, in the implementing code here. So it's just a one-liner that delegates the call. Uh, components are also very flexible. And um, we, we, we put all the components in, 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 in a system in a directory called components. So here we have one component uh, so far. And when we extend the code base, we, 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 just, uh, we add uh, one more directory to this or component to this directory. So that's how we extend it. And um, we can also extend the, each component by adding more um, namespaces, uh, in implement, implementing namespaces to this component. Um, components, uh, we, we said that they are replaceable also. And how that works is that if we add one more component here, uh, Invoicer 2, it's a really great name, um, and if that um, uh, component uh, has, uh, uses the same um, interface with the same set of functions, as in this case, then if we uh, have a project, it could be a service, for example, that uses Invoicer, then we can uh, just replace that component with Invoicer 2, in this case, without the surrounding code uh, noticing any difference. So that's where we get this uh, Lego-like um, uh, feeling of working with Polylith. We have one more uh, building block, and that's a base. So what is a base? A base is very similar to a component. It's just um, a piece block of code, you could say. Uh, it has a name, a good name, hopefully, and it lives in a directory with the with the same name as the base. And it has uh, three directories, source, test, and resources. And it lives in a namespace with the same name as the base. And uh, what's special with the uh, bases are that they expose a public API. And that could be something like a REST API, Lambda function, or a, 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 a tool. Uh, so, so in this case, we, we, we just expose a main function here. And they are also flexible. 
and and the way we um, extend uh, a base is by delegating to components. And we don't put uh, business logic into a base. We only just delegate uh, to other components. So a, a base is a very thin layer, you could say, that exposes a public API, and it, and it just delegates to components. So they are very simple. And uh, I said that uh, Polis makes you productive also. How does that work? Yeah, we, we have the, this single development environment. And um, here we have three libraries, two bases, and five components. And the way it works is that we have a single um, configuration file where we specify all our libraries that we uh, use. And then each component and base also has its own source folder specified in that file. And that's everything that is needed, actually, to be able to work with all your code as if it was a single code base, just a single file. And then in production, it looks exactly the same. Uh, the only difference here is that uh, in, in development, we have only one uh, one uh, project, but in production we, we can have more than one project. And, and, and what we do with the, those is that we produce artifacts from them. And, and this, this artifact could be, for example, a service. Let's say this is a REST service. Then this blue box here this, uh, is, is the base. And this is where we put um, the REST-related stuff. And what it does is that it delegates to the component components that implements the functionality and uh, uses libraries also. So it's very simple, but very flexible and powerful. And the last thing here, maybe I should have some water. Is why? So why, why should we use Polyth? I think we have a number of challenges today in this software industry that is not really solved or, yeah. So one challenge is that sharing code is, is hard. And um, we try, sometimes we, sometimes we duplicate code and sometimes we try to solve that by creating libraries for code that we actually work quite a lot with. And both of them have doesn't solve the problem in a, in a good way. But with Polyth, sharing code is easy because we just have a set of uh, building blocks that we just can use e everywhere. It's very easy and simple. Um, a growing software is hard today. And I think the main uh, problem is that we put code into places. For example, this could be a service. And it doesn't matter how big or small this service is. We have the, this problem is the same. So if we, if we have a service and realize, oh, it would be nice to, to take this little piece of functionality and use it here. We can't do that because everything is kind of glued into uh, one place. So, but with Polylith, it's easy uh, to grow software uh, because we just add one uh, building block at a time, and then when we then we and, and then we just combine them when we know how we how know the way we want to execute it in production. Um, oh shit, I can't. Now I need my glasses. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, another problem here is that we don't have a shared language for talking about software architecture today. And, um, but with Polylith, we have a shared language. And uh, because we have those new concepts or components and uh, bases and projects, 
uh, that makes it easy to uh, to reason about software. So the components we know they just expose a set of functions, so they are easy to reason about. And the basis exposes uh, public APIs, and projects they are just a set of those spinning blocks with by using just one single file. So when you come as a new developer to a Polyth code base, it's very easy because we have those concepts at as directories in the works in, in, in the workspace. Which means that uh, if you want to have an idea of what this code bases can do, you can just expand the components directory and just read because each component will tell you what what it what it what it what it does. And if you expand the um, projects directory, uh, you can see okay, this is the artifacts that we build uh, here, and and it could be a number of services or even tools and stuff. So it's very simple. Um, and uh, I want to say one more thing. Yes, um, it also changes the way you think about software, and. And you don't. Um, one thing is that you don't start by thinking how should this be executed in production, but also you don't divide things into layers. So you, in Polyth, we 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 don't uh, have like two, three, four, five layers or or whatever. We just create those components, and then uh, when uh, when uh, it's time to. Um, decide how to execute it in production. We just uh, put them together into a project. So that uh, changes uh, how you think about software, and 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 it makes things so much easier. Uh, and another problem today is that collaborating on code is hard. But with Polyth. Uh, that's easy. Uh, it's very common today that you work in teams and each team is responsible for one or several services. But they uh, each team work in their own code bases or projects. So they we, we don't share code and so on. But with Polyth, uh, we have one place for all our building blocks and all teams uh, work in the same uh, uh, place, you could say. So, and and, e and and different teams can can share the same components between services and teams. And uh, sometimes it happens that uh, one team, of course, can have one component that only they use. But all components are. Um, it's possible to use them everywhere anyway. No restrictions. Uh, yeah. Uh, today, another problem is that code is uh, o organized for ease of uh, deployment instead of ease of development. So what we do today is that we we create our uh, services, for example. So here we have two services in production, and uh, that's. That's our starting point. How should this be executed in production? And then we end up with uh, two projects to work with in our development environment also. And if we add one more service in production, it, we will end up with one more in, in our development environment. So um, it kind of our development experience gets worse and worse, or it's, it gets harder over time. But with Polylith, we, 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 we not just organize code for um, ease of deployment, but also ease of development. Because we, we, we separate those two concepts. And in production, we can uh, add or change how we run the code. And it will not affect how you work with the code. So that's really, really good, really nice. And uh, yeah, 
So that's uh, one of the core ideas here. Here. And finally, I want to say a little bit that tests take long time to run today. But with Polylith, tests run fast. And the reason is that, so, so how it works is that if you ch ch make a change in a one component, you only have to execute the tests in that component and uh, the projects that are affected by that change. And this uh, um, kind of encourage you to run the tests often locally, which is good. And uh, and the same thing happens in production in 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 your continuous integration server. That the tests, the, the the time it takes to run all the tests, or actually it doesn't run all the tests. It only runs the tests it needs, but the, it speeds up the um, feedback loop everywhere. So to summarize, keep it simple. Use small Lego-like building blocks that you can combine easily. Work fast from a single development environment that gives a really fast feedback loop. And have fun, because playing with Lego is super fun. I can really recommend it. And who made this? Uh, it was me and James that you have seen already, and Ferk, and that will come after me. Thank you. Thank you very much. We don't have any questions yet, but thank you very much, Joachim. You get a small applause here from the people in the. So, next up, who's going to not just go through the concepts and theories, is Firkin, who will actually show yeah. actual polylith. Yeah. Thank, thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thank the you stage very much. is yours. Yeah, thank you. All right. So, uh, I'm going to show you a um, real-world example of Pololet. So my name is Furkan and I'm one of the com contributors to the Pololet project that Joachim just explained. And I'm also a co-founder co of a startup called Scrental. And I will show you how we use Pololet in the real wo world by walking you through Scrental's software development process in its early days. So let's start. So I will start with quickly explaining what Scrental is. Scrintle is a new generation uh, data analysis platform with automated transcription, mainly targeting academic researchers. Users can upload audio or video files and get an automated transcript. Later, they can edit, analyze, or um, change their transcripts on live collaborative text editor like Google Docs. The backend is written with Clojure, and it uses a database called Datomic Cloud. And of course, it's a true Polit project from the beginning. You can say I'm a little bit biased towards Pollet. However, this is not the only reason that I chose to adopt it at Scrintle. Pollet idea perfectly fits to a startup or a fast moving company. It helps you to keep your code base lean and makes it easy to pro do product iterations. It makes your life easier as a de developer. So let's quickly look at how the overall arch ar architecture looks like. Scrintle is a web application, and the end users access it through their web browsers. The front end is a single page React application written in TypeScript and hosted on AWS, and it communicates to the back end via a REST API. And the collaborative text editor's back end is hosted on Google's Firebase, and the application's back end and REST API is hosted on AWS. We use Amazon's transcribe service and Google's speech API to provide automated transcriptions. So when we came up with the idea, we knew that there was a need in the industry. First thing we needed to do was to make sure our solution is doable. In order to validate the idea, we started by creating an empty Polit workspace. The next thing was adding some small components to validate the idea. For example, we created components to store and retrieve files from Amazon's S3 and Google's storage. Also added some more components to transcode, transcribe, and generate text documents out of the audio files. These components let us simulate the functionality needed on our local machines. We were able to transfer files to cloud, start transcription operations on different providers to test their services and parse the resulting transcript into a human readable version, 
and there was nothing to deploy yet at this moment. And we were just working on a single local REPL. Once we proved the idea and it was doable, we started growing the Polit workspace by turning it into a real backend service. We decided to expose our functionality via a REST API. And in order to do that, we needed to grow the workspace with a base that handles requests and responses to the backend. Our new base is called REST API. The REST API is taking care of incoming requests, calling functions from other necessary components, and preparing the res response. This base exposed our REST API to the other world via Amazon's API Gateway. And it was time to deploy the very first version of Scrintle's backend. In order to deploy our code, we needed a deployable artifact. As Yoki mentioned uh, previously, artifacts in a Polit workspace are created through a project. We called our project backend. A Polit project is a simple configuration file that defines which components and base and libraries should be included in that artifact. As you can see, at this stage, we have only one deployable artifact, which includes all the components and the base. You can, of course, have extra components in your workspace that are not included in any artifact. After a couple of weeks running our system, it was time to optimize it a little bit. At some point, we hit into some performance problems. Some big file transfers from our backend to Google Storage was blocking the server resources, so which, which was increasing the response times of our API. We decided to split the file transfer logic into a separate Lambda function. And in order to do that, we extracted the file transfer logic into its own component. We also added a new base to expose this service as a Lambda function. So essentially, this base was exposing a function which became the entry point for the Lambda function. Once that Lambda function is called, the base is passing the call to the GCP transfer component and returning the result of that transfer. Once everything is ready and tested locally, it was again the time to deploy the new Lambda function. We already had the backend project in our workspace from before. We created a new project called GCP transfer and included the necessary components and the new base. Once the project configuration was ready, we deployed our two artifacts separately, one of them as a server and the other one as a Lambda function. As you can see here, all of the components and bases live in the same Polit workspace. We pick components and bases when the need arises and then package them in projects and create artifacts. And if you noticed here, the logger and GCP storage components are shared between two projects. So the components themselves live in the Polit workspace, in other words, in one place but they are referenced by different projects. So if you change any of those shared components, the changes will be reflected automatically in any project that they, they are referenced from. So it's been over a year since the first commit to Scrintle's repository. And so far, we have four Polit projects, 49 components, four bases in the whole workspace. And three of those projects are uh, deployed as Lambda functions and one of them is deployed as a server, and that exposes our REST API. And here you can see that like different components are used in different projects and shared between different projects. So now let me summarize our experience with Polit at Scrintle. So Polit, together with Clojure, let us focus on our product and business logic, rather than thinking about how we are going to deploy them. This is a really great luxury for a fast-moving startup. We spend less time to get a code base that has, one might say, the best architecture following the best practices. It also helps us reduce the amount of meetings we take for architectural decisions. Even in those meetings, Polit provides a common language to communicate within the team about our code base, and it helps us get rid of a lot of friction. With using Polit, we were able to move really quick. We were adding new features, like combining some Lego bricks. Also, the architecture helped us pivot our ideas along the way. If a component is not working, it's easy to replace it with another component, as long as its interface is the same. The other components won't be affected. And finally, working from a single workspace 
with a single REPL is a great experience for a developer. It increases our productivity both during development and also during the day-to-day -day customer support. For example, if we receive a customer request, what we do is we just run a local REPL and access the whole backend functionality within seconds. So, thank you very much for listening to me. And I would really like recommend you to adopt Pollet in your projects. I can assure you that you won't regret that decision. And I hope, uh, I hope you, you do that. So if you have any questions, now is the time. So you can shoot, to, shoot them to me, either me or Yoki or James. Thank you. Yeah, we don't have any questions right now. Okay. From the p any questions? I, but uh, however, I have one question. Yeah, sure. How come you started the Polylith project? I mean, what was the? How did we start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, yeah, uh, James and Furkan worked together at that time, and I uh, they have in 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 a project. And they, you have been doing that for a few months, yeah. maybe. And then I started there, and they already had uh, microservices. Uh, they have just started. Yeah, they have um, had a microservices solution. And then um, we kind of—I thought it was kind of complicated. It was overcomplicated. I felt so. I said so. I suggested to use libraries mm -hmm. instead. So each instead of a few services, we had uh, a few libraries and one kind of main project that hosted those uh, libraries. And then uh, the, um, we, we got that um, slow feedback loop when working with libraries, when working with the code. It was kind of not living code, it was frozen code. And we didn't like that. And then I came up with, the f my first idea was to use symbolic links. That was the old Polyth version that we re released two years ago. And, but now we have, um, now we build on tools.deps. Which uses a single configuration file to solve the same problem. So, mm. yeah. So basically, the the main problem that made Polylit um, alive was the like we wanted to isolate things, but we didn't want to isolate them in the deployment. We just wanted to isolate them when we are developing. So that's that's why uh, we found this problem, and then we got rid of the microservices and adopted Polylit idea. Yes, then we have one more question from David Wojcik. Components and versions. Can read it out there. Yeah. Question is components and versions, question mark. Yeah, you can, what you can do, I mean, um, uh, Polyth, the Polyth workspace where all building blocks lives um, is a single, uh, it's a mono repo. But what you can do is that you can, uh, b uh, this interface can be actually split into sub namespaces. So, so we have this interf uh, the, the package or namespace called interface. You can uh, have interface dot, and then you can have sub namespaces in there. And if you, what you can do is you can put one that is called uh, v2 or version 2 or something if you want. So you can split up the interface inversions in, in that way if you want. And then, yeah, so that, that, that's one way of sol solving it. And, and, uh, and if you like uh, working in short living branches also, this is also a good idea because now you have all, all your code in one single monorepo. So that's, if you like that way of working, it also simplifies that too. Yeah, also like versioning can be achieved by creating a new version of the same component also. Like yeah, if absolutely. You if you want to uh, get rid of the old one and then introduce a new one, you can just implement the same interface and then start working on that. Once it's ready, switch that in the, in the deployed artifacts, switch to the new version of the component. Mm. Exactly. Mm. Okay, thank you very much.